Hello, everyone. It's Phil Jones, and I. it's been a while since we talked. And we always seem to be talking about HDMI because HDMI is becoming the way that we actually get our video and audio signals to our um, products, our AV products. And But of course, um, we would love an HDMI work perfectly, but over the years, there's been some challenges. But the industry has been working really hard to um, overcome those challenges and provide you with standards and recommendations to help you maximize the video quality of the products that you are utilizing, or if you're an installer, installing. And joining me is two of my good buddies, mm -hmm. um, Joel Silver and Jason Dustel. How are you guys doing? We're doing Phil, great fantastic. here. Thanks for now, being right, Joel. So if you don't know Joel, I like to call him the man in black. Joel is the founder and president of ISF. So there's a, a way that you calibrate a, a display to ensure, I guess, consistent and precise performance. And and Joel's team has worked hard to develop that. So so Joel Silver is the president of ISF, and Jason is um, one of his lead instructors that helped that actually worked with me to teach me how to calibrate as well as um, Jason is kind of a man of many hats. So what else do you do, Jason? Uh, my day job is uh, tech support and training for Meridio. Uh, you know, we build test equipment, uh, we teach calibration, all those fun things. And normally we're traveling around and teaching. And when I'm home in the office, I'm doing tech support, making training videos and making sure everybody in the field is not pulling their hair out with some of these HDMI problems. Exactly. And like I said, a lot of the products that his company makes, um, I we utilize throughout our science building at Sound United, and I utilize it for some other things like projector calibration and things like that. So Joel, can you talk a little bit about um, ISF? Because no one can explain it better than you can. Well, let's just say I'm a hobbyist to quit my day job. And one of the things I was looking for was better gear. And I've got the T-shirt that says, we'll work for gear. And <laughs> I was working with magazines and dabbling. And I was just trying to make sense out of the televisions I was trying to buy. And I'd ask good questions to get seven different answers, all contradicting each other. So one of the magazines we started back then was called The Perfect Vision. And we were trying to get to video standards. So we actually went back to the docks to figure out, you know, okay, how many different colors of white are there? And there's one for television, and no one pays any attention to that. And we just found that no one was playing by oh, the rules. We started talking about getting people to work with tools, color analyzers, generators, and we found the PBS stations were doing a really good job. Disney feature animation was doing a good job, and the vast majority of people, even in post-production, were not. The retail environment was total chaos. And a long time ago, one of my adventures was teaching in a business school. And we said, if you can bring order to chaos, you actually might make a living at it. So that, taking a living, that took a long time, but we started dabbling with calibrating consumer monitors. And if you had told me I'd be dealing with 7,300 calibrators around the world and putting out 8 to 10 million TV sets a year under license, I would ask you to find that little jacket with no sleeves and the little straps you could tie yourself <laughs> together with. You can make, you can calibrate the best you can get the the blues to be blues the green to be green the red to be red but if you can't get the video signal into the display all of that work is um uh of not you know it worked, of it not really fine giving in sdr it worked fine at 1080p by the way 1080p didn't work so well to begin with the projectors because the That's original true. hdmi cables were 720 P and 1080i, so the first Blu-ray players did 1080p didn't work on half their projectors that were hung because the cable wouldn't handle 1080p. So we saw this movie before from 1080i to 1080p. And well, if we saw this movie, Jason will tell you, we saw this movie in 1080 to 1080p, then we saw it in 4K, then we saw it in HDR, yeah. and now we're starting to see it in high frame rate 4K and, and 8K, which is why you guys are actually here and which is why we are here to talk about um, th what the industry is doing, because a lot of guys on this call um, don't like HDMI very much. There's a lot of performance things that deal with that make the picture better. And there's some convenience things like or things like um, CEC or or um, audio return channel or I mean, enhanced audio great, return great, channel. Great that idea. They run away Both from of them. 
Really great ideas. Like, by the way, what you just talked about in multiple generations leads to one of ISF's prime recommendations for custom insulation. Uh, put a conduit in when you're putting a projector up or if you're running something through a wall, be prepared to take out the HDMI cable you put in because the ultimate job of the mm -hmm. HDMI cable you put in today is to be a wire pull mm -hmm. for the next generation of HDMI. <laughs> and if you're not building the ability to upgrade your client's house into mm -hmm. your design, you're going to be ripping walls apart and families aren't going to be happy. So you need to have the ability to rewire your system regularly because it's not going to be you know, every 24 months, but it's certainly going to be every five years. Okay, and so, a lot of so let's right talk now, about this real quick. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about this real quick. Um, um, we were we, we there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of anxiety when it comes to 4k and 8k there's you know no hdmi no hdr um i had hdr then it went away there's <laughs> banding um five minutes later the video goes away or it pops in there's there's static um uh the the picture looks pale because the 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 the, the, the source is sending hdr and the tv thinks it's sdr there's all of these different things going on. The picture looks dark on a projector, and it used to look so bright when I was looking at it on my my regular flat panel TV. So a lot of times people want to run away from this stuff, and and that's why we're here. So let's first let's talk a little bit because we could talk just about the challenges forever. Let's talk about what you guys, you two, have been doing to work on a solution for this particular problem? Well, let's talk about the goal first. The goal is a big, bright, colorful picture that knocks my customer's socks off. That's mm -hmm. the whole goal. Bigger, mm -hmm. better, newer. And mm -hmm. to get that, we need bandwidth. And mm -hmm. we're gonna be wrestling with bandwidth for a while. So the first thing people have to understand is this system is designed to work. It's also designed to be run intelligently and mm -hmm. this two-way communication between components now that breaks down. So mm -hmm. if you don't have a good communication stream between your TV, which you know in HDMI terms, we'll call it a sink. You pour mm -hmm. a signal into it, it's a sink. And a source, mm -hmm. which obviously is just a source. But mm -hmm. they've got to have communications. If we go to 4K, all the early 4K TVs were wonderful, except none of them did HDR, mm -hmm. not a single one. So then HDR comes out and all of a sudden, the TV basically asks for SDR, even though it's 4K. And neither hell or water or high water will make that thing do HDR. So now you got to buy a new TV. And hopefully, you're running it through a place where the display identification data did mm -hmm. or enhanced, extended, mm -hmm. third generation. There's a handshake between the devices. And the sync will tell people, hey, my preferred resolution is X. I can do this. I can't do that. And it lays down the rules for what is going to be the picture that's going to be displayed and the source is going to send what the sync asks for. So the first thing you need to do somewhere along the line is read that damn edit. You need a tool to be able to say, what the hell is my TV asking for? And sometimes, Jason, in the early days, did you have to turn the HDR request on the TVs on manually? Oh yeah, that I mean that was it was like that until last year, maybe the year before. You if you didn't go into the HDMI input menu and hit a button or flip a switch, then the EDID never asked for all the good stuff. Were the manufacturers crazy, or did they know something like maybe there's no HDR sources? So yet? it's funny because at first, like day one, we're like this is weird, but day one in one hour we go, wait a second, this is smart because. Yeah. <laughs> If, if yeah, if uh, if you plug a cable box into that high bandwidth input and it's asking for HDR, the cable box might say, I don't even know what that is, and that's where you start to have some of the problems that Phil listed before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, number so one, read, read read the edited, know what your TV is asking for. Uh, number two, basic ground rule of anything electronic nowadays: before you get involved in pressing buttons, running wires, do a firmware update on everything in the system. Mm -hmm. Bring it up to date because Jason and I and thousands of calibrators are reporting to manufacturers who thankfully are paying attention yeah. and they're listening. And what ends up happening when they get 10, 12, 14 of the same complaints, bingo, firmware update. Now, this is a two-edged sword. In the early days, when you shipped a TV, it better be right. If mm -hmm. not, there was a guy on a truck with a soldering gun to fix it. Then we got a little sloppier where you could actually go in and do firmware 
with a USB key. Now we get real slop in manufacturing because we can quote unquote fix it in post. Fix it in post, yeah. And we do. So you get a new TV, just like a new laptop, get your updates done. You get an AVR. Well, you guys are pretty good at updating the AVR stuff too. That mm -hmm. doesn't look like it's something that needs a firmware update, but you do it because you find things in the field and you fix it with an update. Well, this, is a, this is an important point. Let's stop here for a second. Yeah. Um, installers don't like to update <laughs> their <laughs> fevers. Um, we don't why? Them. Because a lot of times they're worried that if they update it, something else is going to break Absolutely. or they have to roll the truck out there. But in the, to, in, the world of digital, right. in the world of digital, it, it needs to happen. You're going to have to go out there and, and do that firmware update. That, may, that ensures that um, e um, both devices, the source, the sync, and the repeater, which hap the repeater happens to be, source is your Blu-ray player, repeater is anything in between. So whether that mm -hmm. is your your um, um, HDMI extenders, your your video switching device, your AVR, um, it has to be updated and make sure your TV is updated. Because if all three don't update, basically the TV says, the, the source says, who are you? And the receiver is supposed to tell the, um, the source what the sync is. And if they don't, if, if that's wrong, um, that's where the problems happen. It feeds a signal that's too big or too small for what it needs to do to get the job done. So everything has to be updated. So you installers that are out there that are afraid to update, you need to update. Now, the edit is one thing. The other thing that happens all the time that we, cause we can we can talk forever about just the edit is things like there's a lot of other little wires going down this thing. Like for, like for example, the hot plug detection. Um, uh, Jason, what happens with hot plugs sometimes? Um, well, if there's no hot plug, that's the end of the story. Like there's no, <laughs> there's, there's nothing. After nothing happened. You're, so, dead in, you're dead in the water. Yeah. Yeah. So everything. one thing that we found that was interesting and actually see it up on the slide right now is that um, the, the five volt pin inside of the HDMI cable, I have one here, but you won't be able to see it on camera. But if you look at an HDMI cable head on, you'll see that one pin in there is recessed. And that's, that's for, that's for what we're talking about. And if, you know, and I know this sounds silly, we've been, this is troubleshooting 101, but if you don't have that HDMI cable in all the way and snug, that connection never happens and you, you don't get a picture. So, um, Jason, you know, we're going, is, that, is that brilliant or is that brilliant? No, I, I think it is. Um, yeah, I think brilliant. it is. And we're, we're kind of, we're kind of back to honestly troubleshooting 101 is, is it plugged in all the way? But, you know, in, in previous technologies, um, you know, you'd see a picture right away, you know, everything was okay, but if you're setting up a system with multiple components, an AVR in between, maybe there's an extender, you get everything connected or what you think is connected, you fire the system up and something's not playing. So, you know, that's one of the first things that you check is just make sure it's plugged in all the way, nice and snug. Well, let's talk about the hot plug too. The hot plug is powered by the display, correct? And sometimes the, the, the that power, that five volts, starts to drift. It's five volts and then mm -hmm. along the way it becomes four volts, yeah. then along Long the way volts. it becomes three volts, and all of a sudden the picture goes away. Mm -hmm. And they call you as an installer or your spouse yells at you because all of a sudden they were watching TV and the picture went away. A lot yeah. of times that, when you see that, that is a that could be a hot plug issue. So if you talk to companies like Meridio, they have devices to ensure that you have consistent hot plug. Now, before we go all in this, the reason why I have you guys here is the fact that um, we know there's all these things that should happen. It should have this. It should do this. It should be this. But the problem is it wasn't really written down mm -hmm. <laughs> for, yeah. for anything. Yeah. And and that's where um, uh, Joel and, and Jason come in is they've been working on this, this recommended practice document that talks about, um, defines the terms, explains to you what's going on with HDMI, tells you things you should do uh, to ensure consistent, reliable performance. And now um, everybody in the industry has a, a document that they can refer to um, to ensure that they get reliable performance. Now, this document is available to CTA members, right, Joel? That's it's for professionals and, and, and CDA members, yes. And CDA members, but as a consumer, because of this document and because of Jason's work and Joel's work, you know that your installer, your dealer, your manufacturer are all talking the same language and are all trying to be on the same page to eliminate a lot of the things that factors and issues that used to occur with HDMI along the way. So talk about this document a little bit, Joel, 
And then we'll go in and talk about other things that make HDMI um, challenging and and ways we can make it better. What started this going was a rewrite of the home theater performance standard that we did last in 2017. And we actually tabled that rewrite because in those days, what's the point of having HDR calibration if you can't turn it on? So Mm -hmm. we paused the video doc, which just opened up a few weeks ago. Jason's a co-chair now with me as well. Uh, We put together the toughest, smartest group of HDMI experts I know on the planet, from Australia to the European continent, to manufacturers, to scientific people, to studios, to integrators. Uh, Basically, as co-chairs, what Jason and I do is put the smartest people in the world together, let them fight it out and watch a fur fly. And one of the things we had to figure out was, you know, first of all, what happens first? What happens second? What's mm-hmm. the symptom? So one of the things we were seeing is the picture was blinking on and off mm-hmm. and like on, off, on, off. And that's by design. Mm-hmm. That's to tell you that your HDCP is not working properly. It's not an accident, but hot plugs, the very first thing that happens. And what mm-hmm. this document does, it gives you case studies which we pulled from Meridio, from Crestron, from Sony, from a whole bunch of people. What are your 10 most common complaints on the planet? What's happening? We took those complaints, we made them case studies, and we showed people how to make it work. So you can get the system diagnostics done properly. And what this is all about is two, system design and system diagnostics. So if you don't design it right, you can't do diagnostic. So HDMI system design and verification is the overall plan. So the design makes sure it can work properly. And Mm -hmm. if and when something goes wrong, you want the integrator, dealer, whatever you're working with calibrated to understand it's a step-by-step process to make things work. And it does require some tools. You're not Mm -hmm. jumping in here changing boxes till the cows come home, hoping you might, you know, work out the works of Shakespeare by typing something along. It doesn't work that way. There's a procedure you follow and this document lays it out. And the tools are something that can read it, aided. Somebody can send a signal and somebody that can read the signal with a format analyzer. So yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that. Yeah, before now, I plug a projector in, I want to proof that system. I want to make sure that the source is going to be going through whatever switch, distribution amp, AVR, long, short cable. And by the way, let's mention something short, because Jason and I found this out the hard way. Uh, Jason and I have set up systems all over the world, and he's very fussy, especially since when he's sitting there doing the switching for us of 12 TVs and five sources, the back of the rack is facing the audience. So we actually got some very short little loops of HDMI that were just beautifully curved. Yeah, nice. just little guys. Yeah. It, laid out. it looked like something in an award-winning rack at a CD prize, and we had nothing but headache because it turns out that you don't want a short cable when you have HDMI, a modern HDMI with equalization. Under two meters is uh, two meters about as short as you want to go. So we were talking stop, about stop, a very stop, little stop, loop. Stop. This, this is a point. Because <laughs> Joel has a we had, talking about things we're talking and not about, throwing this out was a weird one. <laughs> throwing out the most something that you should really, really know. Because Joel is a is a wealth of knowledge. You would think the an HDMI cable that was shorter would be more efficient. But based on Matt Murray was here a couple of days, who who um who is um from Radio as well and AV Pro Edge, and they brought up the same point. For some reason, the cable. Um, the most effective HDMI cable is actually two meters. So even if you could use a one meter, you should still or buy one, a two meter. Or one foot. Don't use a one foot. A two foot. Yeah, not a two foot. Two meter. Six foot. Six point six feet. So this and is it's something it's that a, it's a time domain thing. There's not enough time. Yeah. There's not enough length to work. Yeah. The hot, I'm shorter in the analog world. Shorter was perfect because there was degradation every inch in the analog world. As you went longer, you lost signal. You know, yeah, you didn't exactly. want that here. Uh, you've got to make the machine work because the HDMI system is a machine. Two things mm-hmm. talk to each other and equalization on the ports is relatively new. But that's one of the reasons it works. You okay. need to so give have- enough time to work. OK, so two meter tip number one. <laughs> two, yeah. not, uh, two not meter sure. cables, especially when you're getting into um, HDMI 2.1, 48 gig stuff, would be to show, uh, which probably going to give you the best, um, would be the minimum link to ensure performance. Of course, as you increase length, it is going, um, um, eventually it gets more and more challenging. We have to go from 
passive copper solutions into things such as optical and active and things like that. Now, uh, and actually Jason actually has a piece of that, which we'll talk about. Now, I wanna go back to this document real quick because that's why you guys are here. Um, By the way, Phil, it's two and a half years of our life. Yeah, it was a long, <laughs> yeah, two yeah, years. A long life. Okay. Two yeah. and a half so, years, because part of the problem was the actual 2.1 system was not fully documented when we started. So mm -hmm. we had people so, from the forum of HDMI on it giving us blow by blow updates as things matured because mm -hmm. the rules were not all put down in paper when we first thought of this back in 17. Okay. The theory so was, but it's now, now a practice, not a theory. So let's talk about this. Um, we're going to, there's a lot of terms you'll hear, eat it and hot plug and um, CEC and, and HDCP. So the first thing, what is all that stuff and where do I find the information? Um, so the first thing they did is they went in here and they put in um, the HDMI protocols, the common things that are going to impact um, uh, how it communicates, um, switches on, communicates, what, how does one device know the other. And you'll see that under things such as HDMI protocol. So we talk about 5.5 5 volt um, power, hot plug detect, CEC, um, um, eat it, and all of this stuff in, these in, this, in this first section. Then they even talk about speeds, which we'll get to a little later. And we've done multiple, I'll tell you, Joel, multiple sessions um, 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 on this channel about, you know, why we're at 48 gigs, if you want to, um, the benefits of that and why the old signal was 18. But this actually goes into detail about those speeds. Um, uh, what is, you know, why do you need those speeds? What do those speeds give you? Um, and then also um, the benefits of things such as um, eARC. I'm an audio guy. I mean, it is called We Are Sound United, which mm -hmm. is who we're, talk who we're here to talk about. So things like enhanced audio return channel is important as well. There's there, this document, like 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 I want to say, I wish we can go through it page by page by page. Ooh. But if you're looking for um, all of the um, uh, the information, also Joel was talking about you got to test stuff. There's even a, a section in here about HDMI verification with test instruments. We'll talk about um, Meridio is famous for making text, test instruments that you can actually use to test your um, the functionality of your device. And I'll actually show you some tips a little later on our receivers where you can check functionality as well. But this goes through and explains that. Um, the document is well laid out and you said it took you two years, right? Mm -hmm. Two and a half years with the smartest people I know putting it all together, fighting it out word by word, repurposing the document, and we're proud of it. It's the best work okay. we've seen out of CTA's committee so far. And okay. we did this in the middle of COVID. We mm -hmm. couldn't meet. We had no face-to-face. -face. It was all Zoom and all rewriting and all hashing it out, and I'm proud of the guys who put it together. But if you're putting your hard and cash into a dealer's pocket to build you a system, he better have read this, and he better know what those terms are. Because yeah. these terms, like we talk about plugging something in and unplugging it. In the HDMI mm -hmm. world, it's called assert and deassert. Now, don't mm -hmm. ask me where that came from. It makes no sense <laughs> to me whatsoever. But when I'm reading a document, it says you need to deassert. Like, what are they talking mm -hmm. about? And it's mm -hmm. a language of its own. And mm -hmm. you need to master that language. And it's only a few pages worth of a document. And mm -hmm. we had to put these things together in a way that integrators could understand, not mm -hmm. engineers. So exactly. this is a translation of an engineering document from HDMI done by a mix of engineers and real world people like Jason and myself to make it accessible to a guy whose customer tells him, I swear, I had HDR coming out of my Apple TV yesterday. Where'd it go? Yeah. And that's a real world scenario and it's going to be edit based mm -hmm. and someone's going to have to fix it because you don't want to be running that truck back to the customer's house so many times. We don't need a GPS. You, know, exactly. you can't have that. It's exactly. got to be fixed. It's got to be diagnosed. So, and more importantly, it should have been designed right to begin with. Exactly. So, I mean, let's be honest. The standard came out in um, 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it had addressed several of the issues that was found in the earlier editions of, of HDMI, the earlier versions of HDMI 2.0a um, uh, or um, HDMI um, 1.4. So it so yes, you do get this massive boot, um, jump in bandwidth. So to support um, uh, these latest um, gaming systems, which is pretty much all that's going to be in 8K60 and 4K 120 right now. But the goal is to work through this device, this system, to ensure that um, we get it right this time. <laughs> the man, everybody's on the same page, 
And we won't be having this conversation about another standard for a, a long, long time. Because, Joe, we can go beyond we this, could, right? We couldn't have done this five years ago. The silicon wasn't yeah. there. Yeah, there's no the chips. The capacity yeah. for doing it wasn't there. And the sources weren't there. Mm. Now, way back when, in 17, I toured CES with a few people who were doubting this. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, you know, 120 per second picture acquisition, not going to happen. So mm -hmm. I just took three of the Doubting Thomases in the press and I walked them by the Sony camera booth, the mm -hmm. Canon camera booth, the JVC camera booth, and we showed them the cameras that in the 17 were already out there for 100 mm -hmm. and 120 hertz capture. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this takes years to make work. The nice thing about the 2.1, they thought it through, they took their time explaining it's not the easiest thing, but there's a glimpse of the future right there. And this is all laid out, by the way, in the 2012 document from the ITU. Mm -hmm. So we're just following the roadmap. And this is one of these extraordinary circumstances where I can sit here and read tomorrow's headlines today because they were written in 2012. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know where we're going. I mean, we talk about 10,000 nit TV one day, like, you know, this is fiction. It's not fiction. We can't do it yet. We talk about 2020 color. I want that. It's not today, but we'll get there. And, you know, all these things are on the roadmap. We have to build the machines, the silicon, the software. And every one of these steps has delighted my clients. When okay, I walked so out after putting an HDR into people's systems who were just fussy people who had like this blase attitude because they've seen it all. When they saw HDR in their own house for the first time, they were like kids in the candy store. Mm. It's not a minor improvement. It's a mm. spectacular step forward. And mm -hmm. by the way, uh, spoiler alert, when you start seeing sports in 120, oh, you're, yeah. ru you're ruined. It's over, yeah. You know, it looks like old standard definition. So all of these things were part of the 2012 system. It's rolling out. And the infrastructure to make it work is HDMI. So mm -hmm. nothing happens until you get the infrastructure right. So exactly. this document is leading edge of what's coming your way and how to prepare your home for what's known to be tomorrow's headlines because they're written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is fun. We know it's coming. Yeah. I'm going to get your house ready for it. And if the integrator you're working with doesn't know about this little document, hasn't mm -hmm. read it, maybe you want to find another integrator. Exactly. Well, I will Why tell you that as a – doing, doing the homework. I get I get emailed all the time. It does not work or is something wrong with your receiver. And I'm like, it's probably a hot plug issue. And I go, what's a hot plug? And I'm yeah. now I can say, here. Here's the book. Here's the book. Uh, um, you should uh, here's here's some things and here's some challenge. Here's some ways for you to test it. Here's some things that you can do to see if it is a hot plug issue or if it's an eat it issue. Um, and then we can go from there. On like on top of that, beyond resolution, we always want to stress this. Um, there's a lot more that came with this beyond just resolution. Whether it's like, I always kind of group these guys together um, for gaming. Now, could you use this stuff for video? Absolutely. But gaming, variable refresh rate, simple. The gaming system, they may be able to do theoretically up to 120 frames per second, but that's probably um, you standing in front of a white wall. Um, the second I have to draw an action figure in a combat zone, with a whole bunch of broken down buildings and tanks and stuff going on, most likely the computer can't draw it that fast. So what happens is the um, the display will slow down and wait for the computer to draw the image. So for example, it can go up to a maximum of 4K 120, but it, the frame rate will change. If it's a complex frame, the computer may only be able to draw 57 or 67 or 92 frames per second, and the TV will wait for that frame to come. And Phil, one uh -huh. day in your movies, your car chase will be 120. The yeah. rest of the movie will be 60 or mm -hmm. 24 because you don't need 24 for the Queen's Gambit. I mean, it, your action scenes can be variable and better. And that's mm -hmm. our future. We give the creative artist tools to be able to make car chases, explosions, mm -hmm. people running around playing sports, all those things can be faster. And saving bandwidth is always part of the game. So that variable refresh rate is gaming right now. Don't be surprised if it finds its way into content creation for lots of applications. You know what, Joe? The saving bandwidth thing, I never thought about that. Because mm -hmm. think about it. Um, if you're a cable provider, you only have a certain amount of bandwidth. Yep. And they're hesitant to give you um, higher resolution and higher frame rates because if I double the frame rate on a on a on a channel, 
I got to cut one cha one channel off yeah. of my list. But mm -hmm. if um, I the commercials can be at 24 or 30, the announcers that can be when they're talking can be at can be at 30. And then when they hike the ball and the guy's yep. running down the field, it cranks up to 120. The bandwidth goes down, and I'm more likely to give you those channels because the load on the system is not as high. Um, this is it a also well thought helps out with, system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this and it also it. helps you with disk. There's only a finite amount of um, data that lives on a disk of 4K Blu-ray. You may think it's a lot, but you can hit the limit pretty fast if you're watching a movie like Dune, which is like never ending, or like mm -hmm. uh, or like the Lord of the Rings. So being able to speed up and slow down means you can utilize less video compression because you could change the frame rate and you end up with a better overall picture um, um, fitting on that disc. So I never thought about it in that way, Joel. As well, for one, one of the video. things we're talking about, the new committee we're just starting up, and we've had our fourth meeting. The basic theme of the new video standard for the home is going to be an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. And it dovetails into the CB22, which is immersive audio. That's your world. So mm -hmm. it's immersive video and immersive audio. And mm -hmm. when I've got car chase scenes that are more immersive, more natural, look more like the real world, when I'm watching a tennis match and the ball isn't stuttering across the court when it's smooth, I've got a more immersive environment. And for that, mm -hmm. I need bandwidth. I need connectivity. I need mm -hmm. system design and verification. This is paving the way for everything that's going to be delighting my mm -hmm. clients, and it's going to change my life at home. At mm -hmm. this point, you know, I'm getting pretty spoiled between the discs I've got with HDR and the streams I have with HDR. I feel like I'm in this high def versus standard def range. When I'm watching something that's not HDR, I'm like, do I really want to watch this? And it's mm -hmm. got to be a really want to watch it to me to tolerate standard dynamic range after watching high dynamic range. So we're going to get the same thing in sports. Do I really want to watch this game? It's 60 hertz. And by the way, we've been doing 60 hertz since bloody 1939 at the World's Fair in New York when we launched it. It's about time to go beyond that. And these are the advances that 2.1 is all about. Paving the way for the new toys, the new pictures, the new sports, and the new movies and games coming into my home. It's mm -hmm. infrastructure. Yeah. And when we see affordable gear, some of the stuff that uh, you're working with right now, uh, one of the companies that Jason's familiar with and actually Meridio works with them as well is Quantum Data. The manufacturers mm -hmm. use a Quantum Data gear. It's mm -hmm. you know, 70, 80, $90,000 for some of that gear. It's how we build things. It's not for system design and verification, it's for building systems. Mm -hmm. Their small form factor units you can put in your hand with a battery do a large percent of what the $90,000 systems do but you can take it to a client's house and tools of trade i mean it's just toys you want to have so when you leave you can have a little kick in your step and you shouldn't have to look at your cell phone and go oh, should i turn it off he's going to call no you want to be able to proof the system and verify things when you leave a client's house have him press play and enjoy himself and exactly. when you have to call the dealer back you're not enjoying yourself <laughs> Yes. Um, now there's lots of tools of the trade, and like I said, Meridio makes a lot of those. I'm actually looking for one right now. One thing I just want to touch on when we were talking about the frame rate changes, and, and, and nobody brought it up, it is seamless. Normally, mm -hmm. when you switch frame rates, you have to re-handshake, right? So when you're watching a movie and it switches frame rates, it's completely seamless. I just wanted to make sure that was super clear. The other mm -hmm. thing I wanted to make super clear in the document is that we wrote that document to be completely agnostic when it comes to uh, what test equipment you use and things like that. So we're probably having a little bit of a shameless plug right here talking about the Meridio stuff, but I do want to talk about one thing in the document. Not every integrator has test equipment. Maybe they're brand new and they don't have the budget yet. They're just getting off their feet. There's a whole section in the document of how to do some of this troubleshooting without test equipment. So we want to be able to help everybody no matter what situation they're in. Of course, we'd like them to have Meridio gear because we know how it works and we know how to use it. But if you mm -hmm. don't have that type of gear, you still can do a lot of this troubleshooting without it. So can, you, can they get an easier meter on your PC? A shameless plug too. Um, and inside of the AVRs, we have things like HDMI diagnostics tools, yes, which allows you to test the bath bandwidth of cables. And mm -hmm. because the receivers are repeaters, they're in between the source and the sink or the display. It right. can actually tell you what 
functionality is going down, what bandwidth, what features are being supported, because mm -hmm. it's just in the middle watching what's happening between the two devices. So, so yeah, I got to give you got to give your shameless plug. I got to give mine too. No, so let's that's, talk that's, about your about essentially. some of your pieces. So let's talk about the Fox yeah. and a half. I mean the 6G and the 6A because I actually love this thing. So the 6G fell into my hands in 2014 when it was still in development. And Jeff Murray, our CEO, uh, we were at a, a training class with Joel. And Jeff hands me this thing and he goes, see if you can break this. Let us know what you think about it. And it was before I worked for Meridio. And I took the little generator home and was using it with you know, some calibration stuff. And I'm like, this thing is awesome. We've never had anything this great before. And this was pre, um, you know, this was leading up to 4K and HDR. So it's the only thing of its kind at the time, especially being small and handheld and not some giant. The only you know, thing, reasonably, pri only thing reasonably priced that we could afford to right. retail. Yeah. yeah, that too. So um, we kind of took it from there. And that was the first product that Meridio actually made. And we found that a lot of integrators out there didn't need that robust of a machine. So we kind of trimmed it back a little bit. And that's where we come up with the Fox and Hound. So as Phil, as you mentioned before, the Fox and Hound is like kind of your entry level kit. That's going to let you test cables. That's going to let you put signal through a system. That's going to let you read the signal that's coming out of the system and all those great things. Um, when you get into things like the Meridio 6A and 6G, like these guys, uh, from the integrator standpoint, there's really two, uh, two things to point out here. A, we're going to be able to use the 6G for video calibration. That's what's going to link up to Calman or Color Space or whatever you like to use and automate a lot of the calibration process. When you throw in the 6A, now you can do point-to-point -point troubleshooting just like you can with the Fox and Hound. But what's really unique about these pieces over the Fox and Hound is that I can leave, let's say, the analyzer in the system for days and days and days at a time if I need to and run something called a signal monitor test. So when you have those weird intermittent issues where the picture just, I don't know, drop sometimes it doesn't drop other times you can leave it in the system for for multiple days if you need to and monitor the system over time there's a few other little bits and pieces too uh for integrators um you know you can read the edit of course uh on the screen itself you'll you'll see the the basic edit information so like preferred timings and the the model i'm sorry the manufacturer of the tv and stuff like that but if you open up the pc software that's free that comes with that analyzer you can see the edit down to like the hex string that that is the edit so there's a lot more advanced stuff you can do with the 6A and 6G over the Fox and Hound, but uh, hey, so the, go back to the, go back to the thing for a second. I was in yeah. a system two weeks ago, yeah, high-end yeah. projector, about a thirty-five thousand right. dollar projector, no HDR in the system. This right. was a compound era. Right. Okay. First of all, the EDID on the projector was turned off. It wasn't asking for HDR. Oh, so it was in regular, yeah. It was in regular SDR mode. So that's a flip switch. Right. Uh, number two, the Apple TV, when we plugged it in to the it had turned on, the Apple TV's menu of pictures basically had no HDR yeah. availability. Mm -hmm. We changed the cable and bingo. So the Apple TV knew there was no possibility of getting HDR into the sync. So there was no option to send it out. Good. Yeah, it's great. Out, if yeah. you had elected that option, the Apple's well designed. If you had picked that option, you would have gotten no picture. Mm -hmm. So they left you a picture. It was SDR, and that's at least a live picture. So the manufacturer is doing the best they can. So this was the old cable. They changed the projector. They changed the source. They left the same cable in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just yeah, minor common. problems. But you no, know, this is a three or four month old issue that was huge. And I hooked up those two devices and plugged it in, and there was no HDR available on the format analyzer. I'm sending an HDR out of the generator. I'm mm -hmm. reading what's going down the cable and it doesn't get through the cable. Mm -hmm. So these are simple things. You need to be able to test and verify. And yeah. it's a simple scenario. You, know, you measure twice and then you put it together properly and you go home leaving the customer a workable system. But exactly. you need to be able to get through this. So yeah. this verification without test instruments. So Phil, mm -hmm. Can you get us basic EDIN information out of your device, devices? See if we're going to be yeah, able to. I mean, check? The, the HDMI diagnostic will check the cable. Um, that is that is a um, there's a there's like every Marantz and Denon receiver has what's called H, HDMI diagnostics tool that will test the bandwidth. It, it will test basic things like um, um, EDIT and stuff like that. You can do some EDIT correction, but the amount of detail that comes from something like a fox and a hound, it's not there. Um, it will check features because people will call me and say, it's not doing variable refresh rate. And I can look at the, the box and say that's because the source is not sending it. Right. So so I, so I, there is a nice thing about the menu systems. The info menus will tell you if variable refresh rate is on. Um, uh, for example, Jason also brought up what's called quick media switching. 
quick media switching has was developed because whenever, as Jason mentioned, when you went from one frame rate to another frame rate, they would have to basically verify your handshake again, and the picture would go blank. So some companies like, I don't know, Apple TVs would take everything and make it 60 frames per second and HDR. So yeah. you wouldn't have to make that handshake all the time. And the client or you or your spouse would not be wondering why um, every time they switch from one thing to the other, the projector screen goes blank for like 15 seconds or five seconds or whatever. The projectors are famous for this. So what they did was they, they, made, they up converted everything. Now it got rid of the, the blank screen, but it made everything look horrible but, because if but, you're looking at the Three Stooges, it was in 60p and HDR. So so um, so this eliminates that. It means that when you go from, I don't know, a 60 frame per second SDR menu to a 24 frame per second HDR, um, most likely it may not have to make a very, it, it's going to be quicker. Until you change sources, it'll still have to do a hot plug cycle when you change sources from time when to time. We change sources, but what I'm going from. Yeah, yeah menu, but within the, the same menu, content. The menu, it doesn't. When you go from Apple TV menu to Apple TV HDR show, it's mm -hmm. going to be pretty quick. So exactly. This is Which just is a convenience thing. thing. Now, that has nothing to do with resolution. It's just convenience. Now, we've talked about what Sound United stuff can do, like Denon and Moran AVRs. We talked about the fact that Meridio has some great tools um, for those um, cust for to verify. But but one of the things, like I said, that's really cool about the document is even if you do not have these tools, um, the document, the this this thing they put together will walk you through step by step um, how to um, verify things. Audio, um, it gives you literally step by step. Turn this on. Push this button do this unplug plug and it can basically walk you through to help you kind of figure out what is going on you know is cc the problem is cc on is it off what's going on with that because i know installers absolutely hate cc but um but there's some but now new devices allow you to switch it off but you can walk through and test everything without having to have gear and there's even um a symptom and cause type thing so if you see this problem um, this may be a cause to help you troubleshoot. So I think this is um, a really, a really, really cool thing. So you don't have to have the fancy tools um, at hand in order to do the job. So we well, went you should have the fancy tool, but if you don't, we they got you. A lot of manufacturers, what are your top 10 service goals? What are your top 10 things you can't fix on a phone? What are the top 10 things that make you run a truck? And we mm -hmm. tried to include diagnostics for the top 10 and Jason, was it amazing that so many manufacturers had the same top 10? It, I mean, it was, we almost got to a point where we were laughing okay, and we were almost like betting, like, okay, what do you think they're going to say? Because this, these other three groups have already said <laughs> these five or six or seven things. And it just, you're right. The same things just kept coming up over and over and over again. And we're like, okay, I think we're on to something here. And we're still seeing it. It's not fixed in the field. Oh, no, Guys no, no. still yeah. aren't paying attention. So one of the things I got excited about when we finally got this approved, and by the way, so one of the reasons it was late coming in, it's approved by ANSI. It had to go ANSI, yep. So yep. ANSI approves these things, and they're not working fast on anybody's regard. On the other hand, a lot of the text that we thought was clearly written, ANSI said, nah, you can do better. They mm -hmm. kept bouncing it back to us to make things clearer, because the mm -hmm. problem with both Jason and I and the engineers, when you get too close to your own material, you start talking about it like it's plain English. Mm -hmm. And you start <laughs> yeah. talking about CEC and ERC and all the rest of the stuff, and you think people know what you're talking about. They don't. So part of the ANSI process is making it legible to non-engineers. Mm -hmm. So that's excruciatingly hard to do because you've got to step aside from things you know and just forget everything you know and make it English. So it's yep. still a tough read. So the primary thing here, the acronyms and the definitions. That's, mm -hmm. that's I mean, the heart of the document. Yeah. It's yeah. right up front. Yeah. Those things. Exactly. And Phil, I don't mind if you publish some of those things for your readers. Mm -hmm. Not the whole document, but the acronyms and the definitions, they came from Meridio and ISF. So we I put think them what in I, there. If you're okay with this, Joel, what, I'm, what I would like to do um, is maybe when we send out the, um, the invite for or the thank you for attending, I will probably put together a list of these uh, of the most common definitions, which you are going to need to know in the future. Because, like I said, that is that is something that I think is fine, and I will actually um, have Jen make that kind of a um, a downloadable document. And if someone's right watching it on it, YouTube, add, add two more things. Mm -hmm. Add the intro and the scope. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. 
Okay. What the introduction uh, is. What, what do we try and cover in the document? You're not giving up the heart of the document, but the introduction, the scope, the acronyms and definitions. Okay. And so one of the things that I didn't know was in 2.1 when we started it was something called auto lip sync. Mm -hmm. I've had auto non lip sync for years. You know, mm -hmm. we know how to make non lip sync work, but if you've got all 2.1 gear in here, lip sync issues that have plagued us for ages are gone. Mm -hmm. It actually and that's works. a big one. That's a big one. If you look here, auto, they describe auto lip sync, and people complain a lot of times if they plug in um, a TV and they try to use the uh, the, um, the the TV's um, internal um, Netflix is being fed to a receiver and the voice was slightly off. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they've added in 2.1 is this auto lip sync. Now you have to support a certain feature called L ALS, and uh, but now you know that that feature is available. So and the cool thing for an installer, if you call tech support and we say, well, your device doesn't support ALS, you're like, huh? What's that? You yeah, know, so, so so that's one of the benefits of the acronyms. So what we're going to do, and um, and now because I got Joel's and Jason's approval, mm -hmm. is um, when we send out the thank you for attending today's session for all those people out there live, I will make sure that Jen adds a, um, a uh, like you said, the, the scope. You said you wanted the scope? Scope, yeah, the, the intro, intro, acronyms, the, and definitions. Okay, scope, only, intro, All these things are on Google if you know what it is, but that, that are all in one place. You're not going to dig it through Google, hope you find something. Yeah, and, so we will and, share that as a document. For yeah. you who are watching this after the session, um, look down in the description below um, for the particular YouTube video that we work that you're looking at, and you'll have the opportunity to download it from there as well. So we're just trying, um, this just shows that the industry, um, is trying their best to make it easy for consumers, installers, and dealers to better understand all of these different things. Of course, if you want the full document, you need to be a CDA or CTA member because let's be honest, they pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they pay to put it together. So so it, it so it is so the full document is for members. And it also explains why many most of the large manufacturers and many of the dealers are, are part of the um, CDA and the CTA because of the resources they provide their um, their members. So, but we are going to give uh, those consumers those terms. So if your if your installer comes in and starts talking ALS or CEC or hot plug, you can at least know what that is. And many people who are on this call are um, people who would care about those particular. Mm -hmm. Acronyms. Okay, so what are some should, other things should, in this document, should, Joel? We should and take Jason one of the moment. We can take just one moment. This mm -hmm. was two and a half years of time from some corporate people whose companies mm -hmm. permitted them to be volunteers here. This is all mm -hmm. volunteer work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I got to tell you, Jason and I kept saying in some of these calls that I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh so my gosh. We learned an amazing amount on this. Now, first of all, I'm not an HDMI4 member. My company's too small. So mm -hmm. some of these things, when we were talking about a diagnostic case, someone would toss out a term. And it wasn't in the glossary and mm -hmm. it wasn't in the acronym. So we kept going back and forth between our diagnostics and what we're missing in the definitions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. some of these terms evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we looked at a long time ago was HDMI cables used to have a little wall wart. You mm -hmm. take the end of the HDMI cable, plug it into like a little power supply, plug it into the wall. Mm -hmm. You're not going to need that anymore. Because mm -hmm. now there's power in the HDMI and there's a spec for it in 2.1. Mm -hmm. So these were band-aids. We stuck in systems to make sure the cable had mm -hmm. power because that 5 volts we were looking for, you talked about before, we're mm -hmm. looking for 5, we've got 2.2. .2. And, you know, <laughs> I'm looking for 5 and now I've got no picture. I know why, so you plug it into the wall. That mm -hmm. can't stand. That's got to go away. Yeah. So, and, and I will tell you that I have actually looked through this document and have learned some things. Like the whole the whole conversation about, you know, a, a two meter cable is um, <laughs> it's more efficient at passing 48 than a one meter. That's like, it's are you you know? it blows up your brain. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, oh, by the way, that's the reason why a lot of these first um, HDMI 2.1 ultra high speed cables just happen to be two meters. So, yeah, yeah, sure. because it's the easiest one to make. So, so, um, uh, and there's some things like that. So I, I've learned a lot about in this document. Now, what are some other things in this document, Joel? that you would like to talk about? Because we've talked about the acronyms, we talked about the troubleshooting. Well, you touched um, on something before that's near and dear, because 
Um, I can't believe I'm publicly admitting that I'm streaming content and enjoying it because streaming has gotten that much better. And it's not that the bandwidth is that much better. It's the mm -hmm. HDR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's the new gamma, all called EOTF. It's dramatically better. So one of the things we found is the majority of my clients haven't bought a separate streaming device. Mm -hmm. So eventually when their TV is no longer current enough, but mm -hmm. They're watching streaming from the TV. So one of the big things for my client base is eARC. Mm -hmm. And we're having difficulty with TVs with old AVRs. Mm -hmm. So at the point where I'm telling people point blank, you're buying a new TV, first question I ask is how long have you had your AVR? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I want 2.1 across the board. You're spending yes. money on a 77, 80, the 83 inch OLEDs now are shockingly cheap. <sighs> You know, those were $20,000 TVs not too long ago. I'm seeing the 77s in chain stores at $3,000. That was ten grand. That's wild. So, but you're living with an old AVR, and all of a sudden, your audio is not working. And the proliferation of sound bars and things coming out of the TV. Now, this is reverse audio. You can call it what you want. It's going backwards down the cable. That's the wrong oh. way. It's supposed mm -hmm. to be an arrow and hey, it goes this way, guys. Out, out, out. Now you want to go out and in at the same time? Yes, we do that. And now, like that's only... an interesting thing, Joel. If you look at your document, it says HDMI, Ethernet channel, and eARC. So it happened to have a good buddy who's a who's a uh, YouTube um, uh, influencer, really good guy, super technical, and he got a brand new um, TV. You know. Um, 4K, 8, um, 8K, you know, 4K 120, HDMI 2.1. He went and got the brand new Marantz receiver that he was reviewing, and he was like, I cannot get ER. It's just not working. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. I have really good cables. But then I was like, oh, you know that um, because it's going the other direction, it's using a wire that most people aren't using. So your <laughs> HDMI cable has to say HDMI with Ethernet, because if it doesn't have that wire in the cable, Nothing there's goes no way yeah. to send the ER. And he was like, really? So he went on and got a cable that said HDMI with Ethernet, with Ethernet, and ta-da, it actually started to work. Now, if you have an H, an ultra high speed cable, um, that an ultra high speed cable is basically HDMI 2.1, and it just happens to have HDMI with Ethernet. But mm -hmm. he was looking at but he had an older cable that supported 18 gigabits, but it did not have the Ethernet channel, and he did not get eARC. And that is one of the benefits of this document um, because it helps you understand um, what's going on and helps you troubleshoot little things like that. There's a, a webcast that I'll be doing in January with uh, one of my HDMI expert friends, and um, the topic's most likely going to be something along the lines of, you know, not all HDMI cables are created equally. And he does a lot of HDMI cable testing, mm -hmm. and um, it's really funny to hear some of the things we've talked about so far where some manufacturers will skimp out to keep the cable a little bit, you know, cheaper if, if they mm -hmm. leave out some of these things. So to your point, Phil, even if the cable's brand new, it might not have the Ethernet channel built in, therefore you won't get uh, you won't get the good stuff. So, you know, don't just um, for for those of you listening, just a tip. You know, don't always base off how old the cable is. Dig a little bit deeper into the cable manufacturer and read the specs and make sure that stuff's there. Yeah, uh, Phil, yeah, because there's like a whole lot of wires in these HDMI yeah. cables. Oh, yeah, well, you know, Phil, I found and, uh, something shocking. Sometimes they skip out. Mm -hmm. We had a pre we had a pre production one of your AVRs here. And mm -hmm. we were just testing it for pass through. It worked out just fine. And they get a new chassis TV in. Mm -hmm. So I just plug them in. I'm sitting here minding my own business, plugged in the HDMI cable, turned on the TV, hooked up the audio system. The AVR turned on and sound came out. I did nothing. I just plugged wow. in one cable. And <laughs> I'm sitting there saying, wait, wait, this, this was no drama. This was too easy. And like, it was absurd. I'm saying, wait, wait a second. It worked. And you know, these are not finished products, pre-production TV, pre-production yeah. AVR, and bingo, no work whatsoever. And that's where we're, that's where we're going. Yeah. We want I do, to be I do want to tell people, that's one more thing that I want to cover today, since we're here too, and I'm sure it's in the document, how an HDMI cable is utilized has been changed on how they run the wire, yes. what's going on in the yes. wires. There's mm -hmm. still the same 19 wires in the cable some of them have gotten bigger some of them are higher quality but it's still the same number of cables but how those cables feed video 
Well, go back, go line. back one slide, please. Go back one, one way. We'll just go back one previous picture. That TMDS. Mm-hmm. You had three of those, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's where your signal came from. Your yep. new one has a whole new term, which is why I want you to get that FRL. Mm-hmm. Now there's four of those. Exactly. Exactly. And, and what each one carries more. That fixed mm-hmm. rate link is mm-hmm. high powered. Now here's the miraculous part. Mm-hmm. Hook up your brand new 2.1 in both directions, mm-hmm. and you get the FRL hooks up. Hook up mm-hmm. your source at 4K 2.1 into an older TV set. It will automatically reconfigure itself to the old TMDS standard. Okay. It will well, just but I do have to say something, Joel. Modern. It's going to go back to an old 3 channel system instead of a four without you having anything to do with it. It's going to make the old work with the new. I will tell you one thing about that. Um, When you put a repeater in the middle, um, such as a receiver that has upscaling capabilities, like a Denon or Marantz, (laughs) um, it can take the three channel, which was the, like we were talking about before, the the, uh, TMDS 18 um, gigabits per second, 4K, um, 24P, and it can upscale to 8K at 24 frames per second FRL inside of the receiver. Now, if you look at the receiver, you will see that a lot of receivers will have um, like an HDMI, and they'll say, do you want standard, do you want enhanced, mm-hmm. or do you want 8K enhanced? You got to pay attention to which one you pick. Um, if I, the reason why standard is there is to make it backwards compatible. So if you got a PlayStation one or a laser disc player that happened mm. or something crazy like that, then one of the very first HDMI source and you were, and you want it to work. That's where standard is for. Most people don't need that. Then you have enhanced enhances for new Blu-ray players, gaming systems, uh, up to 4k, um, at, um, 18 gigabits per second, which is 4k at 60 P HDR. If you switch that receiver to 8K enhanced, you better have a TV that supports HDMI 2.1 because the receiver will take everything, whether it's FRL based or whether it's TMD, uh, TMDS based, the old version, and it's going to change it to the new communication standard, this FRL. And if your TV is too old, it won't understand that. So basically, um, it converts everything to Italian, and your your TV better speak Italian. And what we end up happening is people go, "Hey, if 4K and if, if enhanced is better, 8K enhanced must be even better." <laughs> and then they'll turn it up, and all of a sudden their TV gets um, there's no picture, and they complain. Or after a while, the uh, it doesn't. It, so make sure on a Denon and Marantz AVR, if you select 8K enhanced you have a display that is HDMI 2.1. can support 4K 120 or 8K 60 input. If not, you may, the even though if the two devices would normally communicate, the receiver will override that and boost it to a point where your the display cannot. So well, goes, that's, that's where goes, your reader comes in. You should have had someone read the EDIT on the TV set before you set the AVR. Yeah. What can yeah. a TV take? So don't exactly. feed it something that it can't take. Okay? <laughs> exactly. And you're going to blow the system up because you're feeding it something <laughs> you possibly understand. So someone should have read the EDID before you flip that switch. Exactly. And, way, and the receiver will remind you. The receiver will say, are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure? You know, you're not going to get an EDID reader. Sure. Maybe you, you should. And it'll 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 ask you it'll ask you that before it'll let you do it. So, Jason, what's an inexpensive eated reader? Can you get one for your PC? Free. Free. Free is a, free is a good what? price. Where, where do you get free? Where do you get free from, Jason? Um, there are some resources online that you can utilize your HDMI port on your laptop to read the edit yep. of a display. Can you can you send me that link? Because I want to make a slide with that. Because, <laughs> tell you what. because they always have a habit of blaming the black box without checking there, the other device. There are device, few, manu- so. few manufacturers putting it out as a courtesy. Yeah. And, you know, that free is usually a good price. But you know, at least look before you leap. Get a read of the edit of what's going on. And that's your first step in mastering HDMI. Mm-hmm. Understanding edit is step one. 
it's it, it's really funny too, um, especially as a, a geek turned professional here, um, seeing what's in the Eated. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's not like it's a lot. There's a lot more in there that you would think. I mean, it has the Eated has to list every single video format the display can handle, every mm -hmm. single audio format the display can handle. So when you look at that Eated information and take a deep dive into it, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in there. In fact, there was a um, there was a, a thread on Reddit one time, and it was uh, somebody was having just a hard time. Um, I can't remember exactly what his source was, but he was trying to do this very specific format and the TV just wouldn't take it. So I just made a little comment and I said, well, why don't you read the edit and see if that display can even handle the resolution that you're trying to send it. And sure enough, it did it. So, you know, he's pulling his hair out for days trying to get the TV to just display the certain format that the TV just flat out couldn't do it. He had no idea until he read the edit. Yeah. So that's and I will of... tell you, um, this, this is actually true. Like for example, I just put up a YouTube video um, on this on on the on our Cyanide YouTube channel where I took the uh, Denon uh, the um, several Denon and Marantz AVRs mm -hmm. and I connected it to um, an Xbox Series X, um, a uh, a PlayStation PS5, mm -hmm. um, a uh, high end great uh, gaming PC with a GTX 380. I did it all live. You can watch me go right down the line, and I even connected a 8k um meridio 7g test pattern generator to it so we can kind of show um all of this stuff and one of the things that we noticed was um i brought up the screen when i had the xbox series x connected to um and i think it was an lg and what you saw on there was um there was one feature that was on there i think it was dolby vision and you would see dolby vision on there then i took the same xbox and i plugged it into the 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 samsung and you saw everything but you did see dolby vision you know so they were like how come dolby vision is here but it's not over here but eight but the samsung had hdr 10 plus but the lg did not so the tv was identifying itself to the game system so you could actually look at and the receiver was just looking at the eat it and telling you what features were available so before you call me and say my Samsung doesn't, uh, Dolby Vision is not coming from my Xbox to the Samsung, the, the, the receiver will tell you the TV doesn't support, mm -hmm. you know? And then if I plug the, um, the, the same Xbox to, um, LG, to the LG through the receiver, it told me it didn't support HDR10+. So the information lives on the, um, on, in, the, in the signal. The receiver can read some of it. It ain't gonna show you everything. It's showing you, like if you look here, it's showing you, you know, four, um, 480 resolution, um, 1080, and everything else. But someone says this support 19, 1920 by 1200. Um, it may not measure that, but the edit will actually tell you if it supports mm -hmm. it or not. Exactly. Oh. The other kicker, so though, your edit is gonna give you a preferred resolution. What <laughs> that's the TV first thing that's listed first. Yep. Okay, and that's what TV is going to be the first guess at what you think, what they think you're going to send it, mm -hmm. what kind of picture you're going to send it. Which now, hopefully again, the best. In the early <laughs> days, it may not be the best. In the early days, we had all the 4K TVs. The preferred resolution was 1080p because there was no 480 sources. Yeah, now, with true. the miracle okay. of firmware updates, all of a sudden we get 4K sources. Firmware update came in and TV changes preferred resolution. Mm -hmm. So... Reading these things is important. I'd like to touch on one more thing if we have some time. Yeah, what's up? The other information that comes at you through your signal is what the HDR mastering was. And there are two things we're interested in. One, what's the brightest pixel in the whole Three Arrow movie? Is there one pixel that's really, really bright? It mm -hmm. can be one pixel in one scene, but more importantly, what's the average brightness of it? Mm -hmm. And the quandary we've got now, after mastering 1080p and mastering SDR and mastering 709, now I'm looking at TVs that maybe put out in the early days of HDR three or four, 500 nits. And uh, the Sony HDR OLED used for mastering all the early movies was a measly 1,000 nits. Mm -hmm. So now I've got 1,000 nit content mm -hmm. coming into a TV set that does three, four, 500 nits. Mm -hmm. And something's got to give. So either I'm going to lose all the bright stuff, which is one problem, or I'm going to lower the average picture and make everything look really, really dark and capture some of the bright stuff. And that's mm -hmm. called tone mapping. Mm -hmm. And that metadata, funny term, but it's information that comes 
you know, from your source, let your TV know what they're dealing with, will determine how you tone map. And there's no right way to tone map. Mm -hmm. The right way to play back a thousand nit content is with a thousand nit display. And we've got, you know, Dolby Pro Pulsars knocking out 4,000 nit content. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Mm -hmm. Very simple. I want 4,000 nit displays. If not, some compromises have to happen. So a lot mm -hmm. of complaints we get on HDR, it looks too dark. What a color is it too saturated? Mm -hmm. And some of these things are settings you can do in your TV set to make the best compromise. And mm -hmm. in these early days of HDR, until I've got lots of thousand nit displays, we're going to make compromises. And mm -hmm. going into projection environment, where I do most of my calibration, we're talking massive amounts of compromise because you're not going to see thousand nit projection mm -hmm. screens. Never again. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm running, Jason's been over my place, I'm running 333 nits mm -hmm. on a projection screen. Look, Jason, it kind of look like it, a big OLED. It, it rips, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's just it's one of the things. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, you I'm know, my... I'm also cheating. The uh, projector I have, and a lot of laser projectors actually modulate the laser. Uh, dark mm -hmm. scenes get darker. So I'm kind of doing on the fly what the Dolby Vision in the cinema does by design and with true metadata to turn off the lasers. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside to running this, by the way, if you guys want to play with this, uh, I never thought I'd ever use it, and it works good on dark scenes. But uh, if the titles are dim, it's going to dim the titles. You won't be able to read them, and it, you know the actual mm -hmm. credits at the end of the movie would be illegible because it's going to darken it. But I can get more <laughs> dynamic range than I've ever gotten out of a lamp-based projector out of a laser projector. Okay. So why, let's why? talk about dynamic HDR real quick, because you were talking about the fact that the um, if you do not have the the brightness capability of the of the mastering display, being able to reach the peak brightness. Yep you have to make um, what's called tone mapping decisions. And one way is by using static metadata, the brightest pixel in the movie and the, the brightest frame in the movie, but the whole movie could be like a dark alien movie and your whole system is all looking wacky. <laughs> we have plenty the of examples. Is, that. is what's called dynamic, meta, dynamic metadata, which is found to dynamic HDR. Now, you'll see here it says that there's a, uh, there's a standard for dynamic HDR. And Joel, tell me if, the, if my analogy is correct. Think of Dolby Vision as Coca-Cola, all right? Think of HDR10 as Pepsi-Cola. This dynamic HDR is that white can of soda that you find in a supermarket that just says cola. They're all colas, but one, two of them are branded and proprietary, and this one is a, a universal formula. They all do the it. same thing but one is available to everyone and the other two are licensed. Would that be the best way to explain it? Well, the other thing is the other two are not free. Where HDR10 yeah. is that magic word free, free is a good price. Everything is yeah. HDR10. Now, you want to give the colorist and the cinematographer control over your pixels the same way that your sound engineers control over your speakers. Then mm -hmm. you want to be able to change things by scene, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what dynamic is. HDR does. My editor's looking over my slides and he can't, it, it can't be dynamic HDR. It's redundant. I go, it's the mm -hmm. term. It's dynamic and it's dynamic, <laughs> yeah. but it really means I can give the creative artist control of my TV set 24 times per second. Okay. Now, so HD, so but HDMI... it, but the format is for doing it. That metadata is proprietary and mm -hmm. you have to buy the key to make it work with your TV sets. So some TV sets, pay the license fee to be able to pay brand X Pepsi, some mm -hmm. pay Coca-Cola, and rare ones pay play both. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you've got Technicolor coming, mm -hmm. and you've also got a flavor which is magnificent. It's the most beautiful solution I've seen. HLG, a it's compilation so of the most brilliant people at the BBC, mm -hmm. coupled with the people from the public broadcasting in Japan, mm -hmm. and they came up with a global free system called Hybrid Log Gamma. So it's mm -hmm. the NHK and the BBC, two of the most awesome organizations on the planet, mm -hmm. working together, delivering us off air, mm -hmm. high dynamic range. So and you've got good. multiple formulas. Now, yeah. all of this comes, by the way, just to delve quickly, this all came out of a book in 1999 out of Amsterdam by Mr. Barton, Peter Barton, who came up with a little book called The Contrast Sensitivity of the Human Eye. And after 80 years of trying to make tubes rule the TV world, which they did for a very long time, this young biological genius sits there and says, wait a second, forget the tube, forget the LCD, forget the other. What do we see? 
How do we How does it work? In contrast. So the beauty of the Simpty work and the Dolby work and Peter Barton's work is it's based upon us. So when I'm looking at high dynamic range in any flavor, Dolby, HDR 10 plus, HDR, whatever, Philips, Technicolor, it's all better than anything coming out of a tube because it's based upon us. So when my clients look at it and go, wow, they should go, wow. It's a major step forward. What did it take? Infrastructure with bandwidth, infrastructure to make the movies, tremendous amount of production costs. And what amazes me right now with the streaming centric world we've got at the moment and finding first run movies in my home at 20 bucks. We've been trying to do that for 10 years and failing. The one silver lining in the COVID cloud is we've done 10 years worth of progress in six months. We've got content that we never had before. And if your system's not ready for it, you're missing out. Mm-hmm. If you can't do the Atmos immersive audio, and you can't do, and we're going to use this term immersive for video because all the HDRs with more color and more dynamic range and this different attack of the human eye, this EOTF, electro optical transfer function, based upon the eye instead of a tube, it just looks better. Mm-hmm. And if you're not in the game, you're missing out on the work of some of the most creative geniuses of our time, knocking out movies that I'm watching at home with my kids. Mm-hmm. in my house first run it's a knockout time we've never had anything like this before but you got to get your infrastructure right mm-hmm. your cabling has got to be correct you've got to have things set up correctly we're going to suffer through tone mapping for a while until our tvs get brighter i remember ultimately we'll go more color and more light this story mm-hmm. ends theoretically at ten thousand nits which may never happen in energy star, but that's theoretically where it ends. It ends at 2020 color space. And we've got lasers and quantum dots that could do that now. Mm-hmm. There's no content yet, but there will be. And this EOTF for the eye, it's a good story. And okay, so I tell, I tell my clients by pressing play and I knock their socks off. This is fun. Yeah. So, so the big thing we want to get across is because of this, the HDMI 2.1, the your TV's capabilities are going to improve. They're going to have wider color capabilities, higher brightness capabilities, whether you have projectors or flat panels. There's a lot more um, uh, enhancements to make your experience better, where there's variable refresh rate um, to, like I said, like we talked about the benefit of that for movies, uh, minimizing the amount of unused Un- unnecessary bandwidth utilized to um, making a gaming experience better. Quick media switching to make your to make it switch from the menu to the movie faster. Better audio capabilities, better control of your device. Um, all of these different things. So the goal is high quality video, high quality audio, better controlled to take advantage of the higher capabilities that are coming in the future. 10K TVs and and 5,000 nit televisions and 10,000 nit TVs. Um, the goal is to build a standard for that. But as Joel and Jason mentioned, you can have the best source, you can have the best display, but if you but how they interact, how they're connected, how you verify the connection is critical. Which is why the CDA and the CTA put together this document. You with um, and and I'd like to thank Joel and Jason for their hard work. Now we are getting to the end. We have 90 minutes, but we are going to stay for about another 20 or so and answer some of the questions. But for those who have to leave, um, thank you for coming and attending. Uh, Joel and Jason, thank you for coming and the document you put together because I think it's a great tool for us in, for those installers out there. Um, so thanks, guys. Our Absolutely. pleasure. It was a labor of love for us, and we learned a lot doing it. Yep. And I'm better at my job because we chaired this committee, and I learned how to do things I didn't know how to do. Mm-hmm. And my clients are benefiting, and I get in, get out, and the systems work, and I don't have to go back there every three days. So exactly. this is critical infrastructure. And again, what's the infrastructure bringing us? All the above you mentioned. Mm-hmm. The infrastructure has yeah. got to be in place, and it's got to be at, I've never seen these words used with HDMI before, a robust HDMI system. Exactly. Robust, reliable, yeah. and robust. Never been, never been used before with HDMI, and I exactly. wouldn't have used it on anything other than 2.1. But with this dock and 2.1, we can build a robust HDMI system. Yeah. So don't fear the HDMI. So for yeah. those who have to go, I'd like to say thank you. Um, but we're going to stay and answer some questions. Some questions. So, there, so I'm looking at some of the questions here. So some people were asking, um, 
uh, David was asking, David Santos was asking about the link to the document. But as we mentioned, uh, David, the uh, document itself is for CDA members, but we're going to also, but we are going to provide portions of that document for everyone who has attended this session. It'll be, um, Jen is gonna, I gave Jen, I'm giving Jen homework. Mm -hmm. um, she's gonna grab the um, certain sections, the acronyms, definitions, um, the description at the beginning and uh, uh, the scope. The scope. Yeah. And we're going to share that with you, which is a pretty good um, um, amount of information. So you do, you will also have that material coming to you soon. And and Phil, CD, mem CD members can download it from the CDA site yeah. and CTA members can download it from the CTA site. And CD, by the way, CDA is a member owned organization. It's all dealer owned, integrators. CTA mm -hmm. is a manufactured owned organization. And it took mm -hmm. a lot of years for them to figure out they actually should be loving each other, not competing with each other. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, unless they make what we need, unless we can put in what they manufacture, we don't have an industry. So seeing these two organizations work together over the years has just been what we needed to make things work in the field. And, and the R10, the Residential 10 Committee of CTA, has been listening to consumers for a long time. And that's how progress happens. That's real, why you're... Real. Real quick, too, if I could just throw it out there, if somebody is kind of stuck in the field and they're not sure what one of those terms mean, maybe they didn't print out the paper that Phil's going to send everybody, uh, those definitions and acronyms and terms are on the Meridia website. So, you know, you're trying to find something real quick, you can't find the document, you know, go to your smartphone, meridio.com. There's a uh, resources tab at the top, hit the resources tab, and then there's an AV glossary up there. So just wanted to throw that out there in case you guys are uh, in a pinch and you need to look up something really quick. Yes. So let me see here. So, so there are some really technical questions in here, Joel and uh, and um, and Jason. Um, somebody asked. It was Tom. He was asking, "What TV is better? One that has, you know, like say you had a a 48 gigabit input with a uh, what do you say, 19 uh, 1190 max uh, megahertz max pixel clock, or one that has 48 gigabit inputs and a 600 megahertz pixel clock?" Does it matter? Not important. I'm more concerned about the dynamic range of the TV. Can it handle yeah. the HDR? What is the black level? What is the peak white level? What's the mm -hmm. color saturation? That is so much more important than anything having to do with the question. Concentrate on the image itself. The infrastructure behind it won't be visibly important. Yeah. But now I will. Point, I will also. I will also point this out, and I always stress it. Most consumer, 99.99999% of video displays that are available for for consumer use are 10-bit panels. And if you have a 10-bit panel, 4K at 120 frames per second, 10-bit at 444 maximum um, chroma sample, the best signal that TV can support is 40. Okay. Mm -hmm. 8K60, based on the way the standard is laid out, um, with the best um, chroma sample it can support, is 40. 48 is great, but it's like telling a Ferrari, a, telling a Volkswagen to go 400 miles an hour. It may be able to do it in the future, but right now the TV knows what you want it to do, but it just can't do it yet. So as Joel mentioned, um, it's more about um, uh, what do you do with the information? I want the blacks to be zero, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Can you get as black as possible? And I want the brightness to be um, 100 and 250 nits. Can you do and that can, properly? Can you do so, all the colors? If can the you color do all the colors? Is P3, can you do P3? Exactly. These are colossal advantages of a TV where small bits and resolution and pixel count, you know, it's minor. And right now, what you see in the consumer world, you're not going to get any 444 content coming your way. No. Exactly. You're going to get 40. Exactly. So I would rather, if I All see a TV zero. that's 40 and one that's 48, I would, I would, I would, the first thing I'd be looking at is which one has the best, the, the best measured true contrast yeah. and mm -hmm. color reproduction capability. Because that is what's really going to determine what's a better picture for you. Okay. It was, um, a huge, it was a huge Simpty movement. The Simpty was just saying, you know, we're doing all this content creation. Why don't we just go back to 1080p and do HDR in 1080p? And they're not wrong because they were a little behind the eight ball because the whole industry has gone 4K. I'm going to mention 
that that horse has left the barn already. But we could have done a fine job on 1080p with HDR and wide color gamut and high frame rates. And for most people in most viewing environments, 1080p is fine. The uh, jump to 4K really helps when you get bigger pictures. And the jump to 8K, most people are missing the boat in 8K. This thing exactly. is no content. Um, yeah. I like 8K because of what it does to 1080i. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can take a lot of my content that I watch, which is you know, high definition. It's 1080i, 720p. The 8K mm -hmm. TV processing does a really good job of massaging those few pixels I've got into something resembling a picture. Mm -hmm. So I can do better processing in 8K than I can in 4K. No one's talking about processing. No one's talking about, oh, there's no 8K content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm stuck with volumes of 1080i mm -hmm. that you know, really needs help. And 4K does a better job than 2K. 8K does a better job than that. Okay. So, um, so Jason, you were going to say something. What were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. For for those kind of, uh, and I, I apologize, I forget the the person's name who asked the question. But um, on it was the Tom. Uh, Tom. Okay, thanks. Yeah. On the uh, on the Meridia website, there's also an HDMI 2.1 bandwidth chart, which can be really helpful to kind of figure some of this stuff out. And the one thing I just want to point out because uh, it's been sort of a, a a pain point for a lot of people in the past two or three years is. You know why why are the manufacturers only doing 40 gigs right now and you know we have to think about what's going on right now with chip shortages and things like that and you know we we don't want the tv to be you know fifteen thousand dollars we want it to be three thousand dollars so um one of the big things to to think about there is when you look at that bandwidth chart one thing that you'll notice is if you're talking about uh 40 to 48 gigabits per second i, I forget the exact amount but i can count them on one hand how many formats are actually up there and there you go phil you've got it pulled up right now so yeah, that's, that's um, the isf slides were put together years ago yeah yeah so and remember too there's going to be kind of two versions of it there's going to be the uncompressed version and the compressed version that's using dsc so mm -hmm. even when you're using dsc and you're doing like 10k 120 i want to say that still fits just under 48 but there's only three or four formats under that so we're going to do almost everything we need to do in the next five plus years in 40 gigabits per second. So just please keep that. that just now, I, will, I will mention something define about the DSC, compression please. thing. Jason, Second. define DSC for those who don't know it. I was getting so, ready to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> Phil. That word. Okay. So okay. basically, it's this thing called digital stream compression, which allows you to actually it's it's a loss it's a lossless compression system. It does a very good job. Um, which allows you to display things like 4K 120 at lower bandwidths. Like, for example, 24 um, uh, gigabits per second, you can do 4K 120 when you apply DSC. The reason why I bring this up is um, a lot of times the – if it says this TV or this display or this device passes 4K 120 or 8K 60, they may not be telling you the complete story. True. Um, you'll notice that you'll see it'll say 4K 120 with a little A and a little mm -hmm. B at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Well, one I can't remember is A can uncompressed and B mm -hmm. compressed. I can't remember which yeah. one which one it is. But but one represents compressed and one represents uncompressed. So if you see a display or device that says 4K 120 with a little A and B, it means it can support it compressed and uncompressed. Yeah, yeah. If you see it with one letter, maybe just the A or maybe just the B, it's telling you that it's probably only doing it utilizing DSC compression. Yeah. And people ask us that all the time. Why does your dis receiver only have one HDMI input, um, one 8K input? Well, at the time, in order to have four or three inputs that would pass 4K 120, the only way to do it was via compression. And mm -hmm. we wanted an uncompressed thing so just because you have to look at that little a and b tells you a lot and i'm sure that's actually listed in your document which yeah, i'm sure which we're going to be sharing yeah it is and phil we could probably just get you an updated version of that one that's on the screen right now but yeah again meridio.com go to the um resources tab at the top you'll see that glossary we talked about before then you also see the hdmi 2.1 data rates as well very helpful stuff and the reason i bring it up is because i see this so much on on reddit and, and places like that Try to give the manufacturers a little bit of slack when you see 40 gigs for all the reasons we just talked about. Uh, you know, we're not going to really need 48 gigs for a few more years, and we're trying to keep the prices of these products reasonable so so people can go out and buy them and enjoy them. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to point out, if you look at this one here, um, if you can do um, 10K at um, a, a 10K of 24 frames per second with 40. These are okay? all uncompressed, by the way. Uncompressed. <laughs> uncompressed. 
with yeah, compression, get to the red ones, you can yeah. do 10K at 120 frames per second at 40. So believe me, 40 is enough for it's most people. Fine. Now, it's a funny one. Tom asked this question. He's like, you know, when you, you know, the old HDMI 1.4 standard was 10 gigabits per second. Mm-hmm. The the 2.0 standard was 18 gigabits per second, and yep. the 2.1 standard was 48 gigs per second. Why did they name it 2.1? Why did they name it 3.0? I've, I've, Tom, <laughs> Phil, Joel, I've asked that question a million times myself. I don't know if the next version will be 2.2 or 3.0. I don't know their reasoning for doing it like that. I wish I would know. So if anybody knows, please let all of us know. Oh, it's yeah, Tom, form thing and it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what, what's in the name? It just doesn't matter. But it's the 2.1, funny. the 2.0, that's a huge difference. But yeah, I will tell you massive. that you're not even going to see 2.0 or 3. or 2.1 or something because you, manufacturers can't use that terminology. Right. So what you're going to see is um, back in the day, 2.0 was high speed. Right. Now um, 2.1 is ultra high ultra speed. High speed. So either you're going to see ultra high speed on your box for your cable or you're going to see the resolutions that are – the frame rates and resolutions that are supported. So that 2.1, 1.4, 2.0B stuff we talked about is more of an industry insider thing, but you won't see it on any boxes because we are not allowed to use it. Good point. Phil, here, here's hitting a point. I'm seeing TVs going into infrastructure that's a mix of 1.4, 2.0, and 2.1, and I'm seeing chaos because the legacy formats – and the legacy devices aren't keeping up, and the ability to down res to make the systems work is not universal. Mm-hmm. So when I'm seeing people buy a 77 and 83 inch TV set, an 85 inch TV set, my first bit of advice to them is change the AVR. Yeah. Change exactly. your cables. Mm-hmm. And the second question is, have you upgraded to immersive audio? No, why not? Content's immersive. So this is one of these little system increases that start with a TV and end up redoing a whole house. Mm-hmm. And the I, only way you're going to get stability is mm-hmm. to stay in a 2.1 domain for everything that little HDMI cable goes through. Exactly. I will that, mention for you guys. You're risking, you're risking instability. Yeah. And I will mention to you guys that Jen actually put in the chat a link to Meridio where you can okay. download. Thank you, Jen. Oh, excellent. Good. The, um, the bandwidth chart. Also, since you're on Meridio, there's also test patterns that you can download yeah. that Joel and his team has worked on to help you set your contrast, your brightness, and your color settings on your displays. And um mm. and um download totally those right in there as well because it doesn't matter okay. how good your HDMI is if your black levels are crushed and your highlights are clipped. So 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 I would tell you while you're there to also go in and grab those um there's um there's uh, Joel's um resolution to, to help you adjust sharpness. There's a contrast yeah. pattern in there. There's a um a brightness pattern in there. There's instructions that these guys wrote on how to I, use those patterns. No, so I while you're there, grab that too. Of all the test patterns that are on there, and there are a lot, I literally hand wrote what you're looking for in the test pattern, what control it is on the TV. Um, I'm kind of bummed, honestly, that 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 much work went into that and not a lot of people use it. So I'm very happy that you just mentioned it because I forgot even. <laughs> but yeah, and, and also, too, here's here's the big thing that everyone loves. 100 percent for free. Those downloads. Yeah, they're free. So get your download the um, go to the support page, download the um, look at the test patterns that are available and also download the bandwidth chart. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, Good this is another more, point. Costin one brought one it up. More, one more bit of news. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ISF online course which we wrote in the beginning of covid assuming that we weren't going to be traveling again mm-hmm. is probably the best work we've done jason wrote part of that all my top instructors were sitting climbing the walls so we, i had participation mm-hmm. we've opened out to the public yeah, yeah. It's and a, I hate take your it. course and i love i love hanging out with you guys i've learned so much about video by spending this time with two of you a cedia course but uh, it's available on my site it's 11 modules somewhere between six and 14 hours, depending upon your speed, self-taught, self-paced, and lots of questions you can't get wrong because we give you the answers. And then one last thing, because uh, because Joel stressed this, and um, a lot of times uh, better contrast, better color, and more accurate is more important than just absolute resolution. And mm-hmm. Carson mentioned that watching Star Trek and HDR on um, at, at 1080p looks splendid 
Because you know what? You're more sensitive to reds being the pro uh, Ferrari red being actually Ferrari red and and highlights in the shadows. And, I mean, details in the shadows and highlights in the detail than the fact that you can see a leaf, you know, at 4K from the back of the room because you're not going to be able to see it. So better contrast, better color, um, more accurate colors, a, a properly calibrated TV will go a long way. I'd rather have a properly calibrated HD TV than a blown out, oversaturated, clipping 8K display any day of the week. Right, Joel? Absolutely. The resolution is important, but it's the last, it's the least important thing in our mind. I'm exactly. going to focus on that dynamic range first. We're looking for color saturation because there's more saturation in the content and the accuracy. One of the amazing things about the human eye is we don't see things that are brighter as much brighter, but if you have a school bus that's slightly tinted green or orange mm -hmm. to almost limited a meter, the eye picks up and goes, what's wrong with that school bus? Mm -hmm, We're extraordinarily exactly. sensitive to color errors. Joel, not um, extraordinarily sensitive to luminance differentials. If, if we could give them just sort of the elevator speech real quick on those test runs that were in those major cities years ago with the resolution of film. What we were focusing on in the early days of what we called an electronic cinema. We were comparing a 1280 by 1024 display for a movie theater with a 1080p, twice as many megapixels. And we ran that through SMPTE all around the world, from France to the Middle East, to India, to here. And the tests were intriguing because the display that had twice the resolution had weaker blacks. <laughs> and we didn't identify what the displays were, but we put you know people in the movie industry. These were theater owners and mm -hmm. cinematographers, directors. We had them do an A-B comparison, walk in this theater, walk in that theater, which one do you like better? It was 99% lower resolution that was chosen because the blacks were better. Exactly. It was a no-brainer. Exactly. So before and, we go, yeah. here are the test patterns. So go to Meridio. Under resources, you will see the data weight charts that we talked about, as well as the test pattern library. And these are, if you go here, there's one called ISF. Look at that. Um, and it has all of the different types of test patterns there that you would use for checking contrast, um, for for contrast, for brightness, for for sharpness. Um, so these have always been free. We've given these away for free forever. Yeah, help you check skin tones to pick the right the right picture mode. So amazing free 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 um free 99 for you all right so this is under meridio.com as test patterns and of course joel's imaging science.com is where you would go to <laughs> learn to product, more about his organization and what they do go up to products there uh right here click on that yep oh you're gonna mention the app aren't you go down a bit go down 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 and Oh, there you go. Two courses. You get a discount if you're a CD member for $100, but that's the best course we've ever written. Exactly. And all my top guns kicked in. And mm -hmm. what Jason and I were worrying about over the first level one course first day is mm -hmm. what we could squeeze into a full day in the classroom because every time we added something, we had to take something out. So mm -hmm. we were playing Solomon. What are we moving from the course because we got to add in this HDR thing? Mm -hmm. Everything got added back on the online. We're not yeah. stuck with yeah. a certain number of hours. And you can see that Joel, just based on the people he hangs with um, and the companies he refers to, if you're trying to figure out how to get a TV to look great or a display to look great. These are um, all direct licensees like Marantz and yeah. Denon. Exactly, so so good, good. So so guys, we could hang out and talk forever, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to really um, uh, spend a little time when I saw the document that you guys put together. I really wanted to to spend some time promoting it because I think it's just um, an outstanding piece. And like I said, I can't tell you how many sessions I have done on HDMI and now I have a document that I can actually refer people to. Because awesome. even though we are a audio video company, we all, we call ourselves Sound United. If the video does not work, they have a habit of blaming the black box in between mm -hmm. the other black boxes. So, so I'm, I'm happy. Um, as a um, a manufacturer, a representative of a manufacturer, that you are that you have worked on this with uh, with our company as well as industry experts and everybody else to give um, people who do this for a living 
um, the tools they need and to provide consumers, like I said, the acronyms and, and descriptions that to help them better understand what the heck is going on <laughs> with HDMI. Love it. Okay. Excellent. All right. So before we go, um, I, if you guys want to learn more about um, – um, Sign United does a lot of YouTube um, – sessions i'm going to have joel come back and we're just going to talk about maybe video calibration um in the future and and jason is 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 going to become one of our regulars as well because he is i've already done a bunch with you i like to hang out with him because i learned something from both of these guys every right, single time. time so just make sure that if you want that you um of course, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel because the better, the bigger the channel gets, the easier it is for me to convince these guys to show up. And as well as make sure that um, if you want to find out what's coming up next, go to cyanide.com um, backslash webinars to see what's coming up next. So please make sure that you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want, um, uh, Meridio also has a very, very good YouTube channel as well. And you could find that just by searching for meridio.com. Um, or just search for Meridio on YouTube. And Jason does a huge amount of stuff. And a lot of times Joel's on there to talk about things such as calibration, how to use those test patterns, um, and also the cool gear that they make to um to better um set up and optimize video systems. I'd like to thank Joel and Jason for coming and Jennifer for hurting the cats yes. and getting us all together <laughs> one morning so we can do this and also setting up this webinar. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, so for everybody who came, thank you for attending. Um, as we mentioned, we will make sure that we provide you um, as much of the document that we can um, <laughs> that Joel will allow. I and mean, for it, you it, guys it, it, who are CTA, uh, yeah. CD, that the, the CTA and the, CD, and the CDA <laughs> will allow, and for those who are looking for the um, who are a dealer, or a, it's just another example about why um, you should be a member of the organization. So thank you guys for coming. Take care, and we you, will Phil. talk soon. Adios. Bye bye. Bye guys.